Okay, we are recording. James, how are you today? I'm fantastic. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. James, before we jump into Talking Records, um, cast your mind back sort of 15, 16 months and tell me how you found the the, the, the the lockdown period, how you found that both personally and and tell me about how you found it creatively. Uh, good question. Um, it feels like another uh, another life now. It's like we all have this, this blip in time. Um, I think it was a period of a lot of discovery um, for me. Uh, you know, personally, uh, it was actually a, a pretty solid period. Um, it was the first time I had uh, lived with a partner. Uh, so, you know, my, my girlfriend here, um, she moved in with me kind of just prior to the pandemic, having no idea, obviously this was about to happen. Uh, and that was the first time I've, I've really, you know, lived with someone. Uh, oh, that's, that's it at the deep end, isn't it? If you're going to yeah, move in with yeah. someone and then that's it, you're stuck in that house with them for God knows how long. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, we really just jumped into it there. Um, but it was great. You know, we really we were really good teammates. We kind of learned and um, just learning how to communicate and, um, you know, just being with someone other than myself all day long. Yeah. Um, so I think that for personally, it was, it was actually great. And, um, you know, she was also a great sounding board for ideas and, you know, just just really tried to um, not get defeated by by the world, which I think so many people had such a challenging time doing because it just felt mm. like everything was doom and gloom every single day. Every headline was sensationalized to, you know, it was just it was a hard time to stay positive. But we, we really made it, um, you know, a conscious effort to uh, be productive, to, to to really work out every day and to work on you know, music and write songs and, and ideas and video ideas and how to kind of further this project along. So um, I'd say both personally and professionally it was actually a real period of growth. Um, and for the band, it was, you know, that's one nice thing about um, being an animated band is we weren't beholden to making videos where we had to be on set when you weren't allowed to or anything. We were we were able to really just we had a lot of songs in the bank and we were able to continue to make videos and put out a lot of videos. And um, we actually grew like, uh, you know, by leaps and bounds during the pandemic, because obviously every kid in the world was just sitting at home on their computer. Yeah. So uh, it actually gave us a chance to capture their attention when this fast paced world now, it just seems so hard to, to reach people. So. Um, yeah, the, the pandemic, obviously, uh, as sad as it was for the world, of course, um, for us personally, it was uh, definitely a period of, of growth. Wonderful. Okay. James, tell me the song that you regard as having the greatest ever intro, please. Oh, man, this was a, this was a tough one. I was on the spot. Um, <laughs> I absolutely, I picked this selfishly for myself. Do I think this is the greatest introduction of all time? Probably, you know, probably not. But for me... Um, this band Modest Mouse has been one of my, you know, probably my all time favorite band ever. Um, and I remember when I heard this song, Dramamine, uh, and it just had this really long introduction and this really nice lick that comes in on the bass guitar and then it comes in on the guitar as well. And um, I was just like, it, it just opened my mind to the fact that, you know, you could have like a really long song, really, that didn't that didn't follow any sort of predictable arrangement whatsoever yeah. and it happened to be like i just loved this song and that was i don't know 15 years ago or something and I, and I still love it so for me it was really impactful because it was just not a pop song or it wasn't something you were going to hear on the radio uh and just the, the sounds and everything uh they just just really got into my my bloodstream and um you know it just made me you know appreciate music in a different way so for that reason uh, i picked it because it really it was influential to me it's a great record as well and a great band and i mean you think like how can a great band get any better johnny marr joins when johnny marr joins modest mass you think right well they've just upscaled it again how could you be that cool you've got johnny marr in your band um you mentioned something earlier james you said um about a fast-paced world I want to ask you something sort of around that and the, the way that people consume their music now uh, is far different to how it was maybe sort of 10, 5, 10, 15 years ago. Um, 
we're seeing things like TikTok becoming very kind of key in, in music getting out there. And we're seeing huge desire to and focus on getting on Spotify playlists, maybe more so than, you know, previously wanting to get on the radio and things like that. I know that stuff still exists. And so many of them things in this fast paced world depend upon intro and hook and capturing attention very quickly because you're in the thick of it with millions of bands constantly releasing music and all vying for attention. That desire to hook and pull them in quickly, does that feature much, if at all, in your creative process when you're writing? I would say it has, like, it's it's hard to ignore those things, but I feel I have, a, like, a bit of a new perspective now, and I, I consider all those things now the rat race, yeah. uh, and I just have almost no interest in being part of it. Uh, that's one thing I've, I've just, I'm learning that, um, you know, we've tried for such a long time to get people's attention, mostly I would say the industry's attention, like, whether it be press or radio or you know, playlisters, uh, just trying to get people, you know, in the general industry to start to, you know, create some buzz. Hey, it's like, look what we've done on, you know, look at these fans who have come, look at the our concert tickets, look at look at all these metrics, uh, look at the stories we're telling. Um, but we've tried so hard and we've just not really succeeded in uh in trying to get the industry to kind of, you know, wave the rare Americans flag. So at this point, I, my perspective has changed a little and I'm I'm not as concerned about, you know, just competing and, and being a part of the rat race that every single other person is, is trying to do. To me, I'm almost looking at the long game and being like, hey, if, if we just continue to make special projects that mean something, uh, you know, and are long form bodies of work, because that's what I think that we like to do, yeah. uh, opposed to, you know, I, you know, I obviously the new... The new thing is you see an artist uh, tease a verse or something for 60 days on Instagram and TikTok until hopefully they get enough people to make videos that their label says, OK, we got the 10,000 videos. Now we're going to release the song. Uh, and if that one doesn't work, OK, we're moving on to the next one. Start to tease the next song and the next verse and the next hook. Do that 75 times. We're going to see if this one catches and we'll wait and we'll just play that game. It's like fishing. Um and to me, I just like, I don't know, I I personally in my life, I'm just not enjoying that at all. No, uh, why would anyone enjoy that? It's fucking crazy, right? <laughs> yeah, the other thing is like um, begging people for pre-saves. Um, as, as a fan of music, I never pre-save anything. I'm like, if I like, if I like you or something catches my ear or my sight or whatever, I'm going to check it out. But you know, so I, I'm never I don't want to be begged by my favorite artist to pre-save under the false pretense of my label won't let me put out this song unless I get 50,000 pre-saves. It's like I just see this now. Every artist is doing it. And as a music consumer, I hate it. And also as an artist, I can't stand it. So for me, I've almost like communicated to our group saying, look, like, uh, let's let's just take a step away from the whole rat race and let's just really focus on making special projects and if we do five of those in a row, uh, a cream of the crop is going to rise at some point and, and yeah. people are going to get the word out. And, and maybe it doesn't happen immediately, you know, this year in a viral TikTok, but that's OK. Let's 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 focus on projects that we feel are special, that our audience is, is going to love 10 years from now and tell their friends about it uh, and, and make that our biggest priority opposed to just you know, again, being a part of this everyday kind of rat race. Um, so, yeah, I'd say my perspective has changed on that over the last couple of years. Yeah. Okay. Right, I'm going to take you back. Please tell me the first song that you remember hearing that had an emotional impact on you, please, James. Uh, yeah, Eminem. Um, it was Run, Rabbit, Run, I think the song is called. Um I, I grew up as a kid. I was, uh, my brothers were both punk rockers. Um, so, you know, Bad Religion was played a lot and Pennywise and Alkaline Trio and Rancid. Um, so I really grew up with, uh, with punk rock. And then uh, I remember hearing Eminem. And uh, at that time, I probably would have been, I don't know, maybe like 10 or something like that, 10 or 11. And I was, uh, I was an athlete as a kid. That was kind of my um my lane and 
I remember just just hearing uh, Eminem and just feeling the power um, of of his lyrics coming through and his just his energy and his just raw emotion and just leaving it all out there. And uh, I remember that just like, you know, times where you'd feel nervous or whatever. I was I was a tennis player and a hockey player and times you'd feel either nervous before a game or, you know, you'd feel mad at the coach or you'd feel tired that day and you just put on Eminem and. I was just like, oh, man, I, I can do anything. I can take over the world, man. This guy is like, look what he's doing. Um, I really remember that distinctly, that it just felt incredibly empowering. Um, and it was so different than any punk rock or anything. This was just a totally different type of music yeah. that, um, you know, Eminem kind of opened up for me. And I now I still love, obviously, hip hop's the dominant genre in the world right now, but you know, at that time it wasn't. So, um, you know, really opened up just a new lane of inspiration and, and artists uh, in my life. But the kind of the parallels between, you know, the traditional kind of what people call punk rock and, and hip hop. Hip hop's punk as fuck, isn't it? Like, you know, yeah, the, the yeah, whole yeah, kind yeah. of ethos of, of how hip hop come about with like, you know, limited limited instruments and like this is what we've got what can we do with this record okay let's look completely reimagine this let's sample this let's cut this and you know and form this completely new genre of music that was yep. born on the streets it's 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 incredible and i think the impact that eminem had you know when you know i, I guess at this point hip-hop was probably one of the biggest genres in the world at that point anyway and to then completely reimagine it and and I think he just completely rewrote the book. I really do. It's got to be like, I don't know, let's say him and Bob Dylan are maybe the two best lyricists of all time. Like, yeah. you know, I I think that uh, people uh, don't think about him in that uh, capacity as much um, when I feel like he's literally, if you, I think I saw some diagram or something that like the sheer amounts of different words uh, that an artist is used throughout their career. It's like Bob Dylan and Eminem were like, and a few other hip hop artists were like so far outside the spectrum of how vast their vocabulary is. Yeah. And then you get the rest of the industry, which is like all in this little center hole. It's just like, it's just an unbelievably, um, just an unbelievable lyricist and, and creator, a very intelligent guy. And also, you know, the power of um, how raw one can be uh, and I think, you know, at least that's why I connected with him. He was yeah. just raw. He wasn't sugarcoating. You knew this was a guy who was actually living this life and going through these emotions. And they were they were real good, bad and ugly. Um, and that was that's really empowering, I think, for an artist to hear that. Wow, this is this is what people they want to hear real, you know. Yeah. So you talk about, that, you know, listening to that as a young lad and, and the music that your brothers were listening to. Where, where was all this happening? Where did you grow up? I grew up uh, in a city called Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, um, and I live in Vancouver now. It's about an hour and a half flight from here. Um, it's it's a interesting city. Very cold. Uh, it's I think it's minus thirty five there today. Um, wow. It's a very blue collar city. Um, a very good economy there. A lot of people have good good paying jobs. It's it's not far from the oil industry and in Alberta. Um, so yeah, people were real hard workers. Uh, a lot of big ideas in Edmonton, a lot of companies started in Edmonton, there was a really competitive mindset, I would say there and just like a, just a real kind of hardworking town. Um, and uh, good place yeah. to grow up. It was a good place to grow up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I can't can't complain about that at all. Uh, good, good town for sure. Okay. Is that where you went to school, yeah? Uh, no, I I left Edmonton when I was uh, about... After I stopped, I played in the Western Hockey League, which is kind of the league where the NHL drafts from. It's like it's called Major Junior Hockey. Um, so I played in the Western Hockey League for four years. Uh, so I moved away from home when I was 16 uh, to play hockey. Uh, and then after my career, when I retired, I relocated to Vancouver, uh, but my my brother and and some of my family still lives in Edmonton, so uh, it's an hour and a half flight. I, I still go there, you know, several times a year. Okay. Well, let's talk school. Tell me the song that reminds you of your time at school, please, James. 
Uh, yeah, this one was funny. I, I picked a song up by 50 Cent called 21 Questions. Because um, I remember that when I was in grade school, my mom uh, was driving me all day, every day, because I went to a sports school. So uh, it was a, a school 30 minutes, 35 minutes across town. And we took the four kind of main core subjects, you know, science, math, social studies, English. Um, and then after 1230 p.m., uh, from one to four every day, I was in like a high performance sports program. Uh, so I was a tennis player. Uh, so I would go to school. My mom would drive me first thing in the morning at 8 a.m., go to school from kind of eight till 12. And then she'd pick me up and then I'd be at training tennis from one to four. And then she'd pick me up and I'd go straight to hockey practice with dinner in the car. And uh, I'd get home at whatever, 8 p.m. Uh, and that was what I did five days a week. So we had a lot of time in the car together. And um, that's when, you know, kind of following up on Eminem, uh, that's when 50 cents, uh, you know, just had that get rich or die trying record, yeah. which was just monstrous record, which I, I really loved. And um, there is uh, that song 21 questions that my mom used to get a kick out of some of his lyrical choices, which today would be very cancelable. Uh, so I, I won't repeat them here, but uh, I remember, you know, just being in the car with her and her kind of getting a kick out of it. So I'd, I'd play that song again and what if we play it over and over again. And uh, yeah, had a lot of a lot of real good uh, mother son time on those drives in the car. Man, that's a cool mom rocking out to 50 cent in the car. <laughs> oh, my mom was cool, man. She would whenever whenever Bad Religion was in town, she was always at the concert. She Love was, that. Yeah, my parents, whenever we're on the road, my parents, I would say, have seen more Rare American shows than anybody else. So, Love it. Love it. So, let's, let's just, I mean, obviously it sounds like, I, I like to ask guests what they wanted to be at school, and, and I imagine sport was very much something that was at the forefront of what you wanted to, to do for a, for a job at that point, right? Absolutely. But tell me about home and music was was you know you touched on records that your brothers were playing was 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 home a musical place very much so not in um my no one in my family played instruments whatsoever so that that had zero that influence but my parents uh had very they really like really great songwriters um my dad's idol is bob dylan roger waters uh warren zevon uh you know tom waits lou reed uh, Joni Mitchell. Um, so we had a lot of the, I would say the greats uh, mm -hmm. that were playing in our house all the time. So I think from a young age, you know, we were really exposed to to great music and really great songwriters. Um, and that was that was just always a staple. My dad, uh, he loved Nick Cave. Uh, you know, he was he was just always, you know, playing great artists. Uh, and he is a huge music fan. So you know, he would put on records and he would just listen, uh, you know, in the basement and write some lyrics of his own and um, in the car, always music on. And my brothers both became huge music fans. And again, that's kind of, you know, they started getting into punk rock. And I would say that that, you know, punk at that time, people didn't really uh, consume music like they do now, where you have one playlist that's got eight genres uh, at that time, if you were a punk rocker, you were a punk rocker. And that was kind of your identity of who you were as a person, yeah. you know, questioning society, questioning what your teachers were telling you, questioning, you know, politicians, uh, really having your forming your own beliefs about the world and questioning things. Uh, so I think that that was really, you know, punk defined who they were as human beings. Um, so for me, as a really, you know, my brothers are seven and 10 years older than me, so you know, I was, it was pretty impressionable on a, on a young kid. Uh, so yeah, I would say music was, you know, all around all the time. Okay. You've, it sounds like you've excelled in, in, you know, in an early career in sport, and then you've chosen an equally competitive industry in, in the music industry. Um, tell me about drive. How driven are you? Oh man, I'm on a I'm far on the charts on driven. Uh, that's that's uh, not something I lack at all. Um, sometimes my team probably is like, "Holy shit, man, slow down!" Like, <laughs> um, if, you know, but if 
again, if you want to, you want to be in this industry, it's like, I'm, I don't take for granted what, what we've built and the fact that there's a million and one other people out there that are lining up to try to take what we have and, and to, you know, uh, to, to get to do what we get to do. So that's yeah. not lost on me at all. Uh, and I understand that, you know, there's a million other artists out there that are more successful than we are, who have as much drive as, as I do. Um, yeah. I think that, you know, that's one parallel you'll find between athletes and artists is an obsession um, because you just can't compete at the kind of the, you know, the top uh, of, of both games. If you're not brutally obsessed with what you do, it's just too hard. Um, it would just require such a level of, of dedication and commitment and straight time, uh, you know, from writing records to marketing records to touring, like, like touring in and of itself is like just an insane uh, venture that, you know, people just, unless you've done it, you just can't understand it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, similar to an athlete, man, those guys are they're playing three games a week. They get a short break and then they're right back in the off season to make themselves better for the next year. And if not, someone else is going to take their spot. So um, I think that they're very similar mindsets uh, that you have to have. Uh, and it's a really, you know, it's not for everybody, um, but that's not why, you know, everybody can't do this. So yeah. uh, it does take a, I think a certain type of, of personality and, and dedication to do it. Absolutely. Tell me the first song you remember buying from a record store. Uh, yeah, I remember uh, Dude Ranch by Blink-182. Um, See, that's cool. Normally people's first records are shit, and you've got a really cool tune for your, like, your first record. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, well, again, kind of through the, the punk rock roots of my brothers, I found Blink-182, and they didn't like Blink at all. They thought Blink-182 was like, uh, like wannabes tryhards they weren't they didn't they didn't have the actual essence of punk that bands like bad religion and whatever and, and i'll still to this day challenge i'd be like you know what blink A two made some unbelievable records like they really did they were just capturing a different you know s uh, they weren't as political probably as bad religion or something but you know they spoke to a generation and i was one of those kids uh um, so yeah i remember I can't remember exactly how I first discovered them, but, you know, I remember going to the record store and seeing that album cover that had the bull on it with a bullseye or whatever and uh, getting that record. And obviously at that time, you know, if you bought a record, you held on to that thing. You read the liner notes, you knew it front to back. And uh, I remember, you know, just putting it in my little whatever it was, disc man at the time or a little boom box or something. And I was at that time again practicing sports. So I was on, uh, you know, hitting tennis balls against the garage and just listening to the record on literal repeat until the CD was scratched that it could not be used anymore because you didn't have another CD right after. Um, so, you know, it was a totally different way of consuming music. And it really made you like, you know, get into a band and into a record and if, even if you didn't like it the first time yeah well you're gonna take that thing for eight more spins and you're probably gonna like it by the end absolutely it's weird isn't it have, have people you know you, you kind of die hard punks will, will frown upon bands like like blink for for being i don't know plastic punks or whatever you want to call it and and the same you know green day got it when dookie dropped it was like didn't matter what they'd done before that, they'd, they'd released this album. And like Blink, they had huge commercial success because essentially their songs were pop songs played hard and fast. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Super hooky, super catchy. And it's like, what, what, why is that not punk? It's like, you know, you listen to like the Pistols or you listen to the Undertones, perfect pop records, but just played really angrily, you know? It's, yeah. uh, it's, it, it's, I, you nailed it. You nailed it on the head there. Uh, but when you tell diehard punks, you're like, you know, this is literally just a pop song, yeah. but it's just played faster and with distorted guitars. Yeah. They're like, no, no, this is, no. What are you talking about? It's, not, it's, like, it's like, let me demonstrate and play this on an acoustic guitar as if it was a pop song. Notice the similarities here? <laughs> like, Absolutely. But I guess if you, you're schooled in that kind of Fagazi and McKay kind of mindset, then you're never going to like Blink. Do you know what I mean? It's just, it's not going to happen. And there's a place for both, of course. Um, yeah. But we're seeing Blinker back. Like they're uh, they're coming to the UK, I know that. And uh, 
original lineup again. So uh, yeah, great stuff. Uh, I'm just I'm I'm unfortunately a little uh, I don't know. I'm gonna obviously listen to the record, but their the their their debut song they came back with. I just didn't didn't it just it felt so commercial to me. Like it was uh, it just didn't feel uh, I don't I don't want to say genuine is the word, but um, feels like they're I don't know they're going for one last kind of victory lap and and they're going to make a shitload of money on it. And uh, it didn't feel like dude ranch to me, put it that way. It didn't feel like much of a progression either. If you've yeah. had all that time to go away and come back with something and reinvent yourself, it just felt a little bit like blink by numbers. Do you know what I mean? It absolutely. Like, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Which I was still kind of sad, you know, uh, but Hey, it's like, it's hard to make your first th two records or three records again. It's like that was a time and a place and part of their youth. And um, I just wish their songs could be a little bit more like obviously Mark just went through like, you know, you think you're going to die. Like yeah. I, I wish the record was more like, you know, opening up about their actual issues in their life and what they've been through as humans uh, because it's been such a long time and they've all been through a lot. Yeah. Um, I kind of wish that it was a little bit more raw, not, you know, trying to be somewhat, sexualized i don't know it felt weird to me i know what you're saying i know what you're saying okay let's go clubbing the song that soundtrack your years clubbing please james okay well let me let me first tell you that i'm the worst person in the world to answer this because i haven't been to a club in like uh, 10 years or something okay uh, i am just not a clubber i will be i will happily sit at a pub listen to good music and have a nice conversation and i love doing that um, but I am just not the guy who's ever going out to clubs. So James, I'm going to let you into a secret, brother. Right? This yeah. is episode 476, I think, of this podcast. Um, I reckon every single musician I've ever asked this question to has gone. I don't really like clubbing, man. I like to sit <laughs> in a bar and listen to music and talk to my pals. So you're awesome. in good company. <laughs> okay. Good. 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 <laughs> uh yeah man i i always find it just so perplexing like it's cold here right now and you'll like you know i'll walk my dog outside or whatever and you'll see this club that's got a line 100 deep of you know girls in mini dresses freezing their ass off <laughs> waiting an hour and a half to get inside to pay 40 bucks to go in there i'm just like oh my god this is like i couldn't imagine this but uh i do remember that when i was you know 18 19 and went to a couple clubs it was it was usher was in his heyday uh and i remember the song yeah or whatever uh, and he had little john always just screaming yeah <laughs> yeah or whatever what uh and you know people were just loving it at that point um so i do remember that you know usher was kind of dominating the clubs in my very brief few times that i would have uh would have taken part uh at that point there was no way you could go without even that um i asked you about uh your your drive earlier and and another thing that i'm always interested in in and, and certainly in, in in somebody that's you know been in in, in the public eye in, in both sport and music like tell me about confidence how confident are you and how confident were you as a young lad uh, as a young kid, probably quite confident. Um, I was, it's easy to be confident when you know, I was, when I was growing up, I was always the best player. Like when you're in your, you know, your home kind of territories or whatever, you know, I was always the, t the, really the best player. Uh, so when you're the best player on your team, it's kind of easy to be confident. Yeah. And then you jump up a level and now you're playing against international and you go and you're probably not the best player. Uh, and now you start to see yourself struggling a little bit and you're like, oh my God, well, who am I? You almost are losing your identity of, you know, usually when you're the best player on a team, you're the leader of the team. Typically people listen to you. They look to you for questions when they're feeling down. And then, you know, all of a sudden you jump up to this international level and you're not the best player anymore. And you're obviously not the leader anymore because you're not the best player. So yeah. people aren't looking to you. They're not asking you questions and you start to, really question yourself and, and who you are and your abilities. And um, I would say that, you know, I went from a period where I was, you know, extremely confident to the most probably depressed I've ever been in my life. Uh, and I don't really have a tendency 
Um, thankfully, uh, I, I, I don't have a very large tendency to, to get in holes or to get depressed. I'm pretty good at getting myself out of, uh, out of, you know, mental lumps. But I remember, you know, when I did jump up kind of to that international level, um, that was the closest I've definitely ever been to depression in my life. Uh, just felt like every day was terrible. Yeah. Uh, and you just felt like you were kind of worthless because all of your self-worth was kind of built into your, how good you were at this sport. And when I was struggling, it was really, really challenging. And I wasn't confident as a human. I wasn't, you know, just didn't feel good about myself. Um, gained quite a bit of weight. I remember at that point in time and just, you get terrible eating habits and it's just like a, just big spiral. Um, so that, that was a really challenging time for me. And then, you know, once I was, you know, during, I guess that period is when I, you know, found music or found songwriting, I would say as really just a hobby is, you know, every night we had curfew. Uh, so, you know, at 10 o'clock or whatever, we had to be home and in our billets house and, uh, so I really just bought a guitar, just as, you know, something to do to pass the time and then really quickly wrote a song and uh, just became brutally obsessed with it. Um, and I re literally retired from hockey uh, as soon as I started learning to songwrite. And that's when I would have been, you know, 19 ish or something like that. And then for the next five years of my life, uh, I would say I wasn't also very confident because. You know, I was known as this hockey player for my whole life, all my peer groups, my friends, my family, uh, you know, and that gives you your identity. Oh, this is James. He plays in the Western Hockey League. Oh, I'm so proud of him. My son, yada, yada, yada. And now you go to a 20 year old kid. You're like, oh, this is James. He's a, a, a musician. Like, it, it's just like nobody wants to especially if you're a parent of a kid that's like the last thing on earth you want to say like uh because you know it's such a struggle and people associate being a musician with being uh broke and struggling and and whatever so i would say for good five six years when i had this just belief in my gut in myself that what i was doing was great and it was you know it was gonna find a home in the world i think no one else believed in me whatsoever and they thought I was kind of meandering through my life and would end up just getting, you know, a job or, or whatever. And, you know, let this phase pass. Um, but I had to just have, have this, you know, belief in my core and my gut that this was going to go somewhere. And, you know, and I think once uh, major labels started knocking on our door, I think that that's when, um, you know, at least friends and family and people who were closest to you were like, Oh, uh, okay. I kind of get it now. It was yeah. like, it was, there was a validation there. Um, and and then, you know, now I'd say in the last couple of years that we've kind of grown this thing uh, and we've been able to play sold out shows, you know, all over the world and sell a lot of merchandise and things like that. I would say it's only just now, I would say in the last couple of years that my, you know, confidence in myself as a human is, is really started to, to grow and understand, look, I, you know, my opinion is worthwhile and, uh, I'm capable as a human and I'm I'm smart as a human and I put in a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of failure and a lot of growth through this thing and um, through all those experiences and I'd say perseverance, um, you gain confidence. Yeah. Uh, so I feel like, you know, now I'm on the other end of, of, of trying to be that confident kid who is the best player on the sports team. Uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm slowly inching my way. I feel like to, uh, to that place in my life again. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. Lovely. Well, let's go home. Favorite tr uh, song from an artist from your home County, please. Uh, Tegan and Sarah. Uh, I love this song living room and they're actually my neighbors. Uh, I see her at the, the dog park sometimes. Really? Yeah. Actually mother, mother, uh, Ryan Gildemon from mother, mother. And, Tegan from Tegan and Sarah. We all literally live on the same block uh, in, in East Vancouver. So uh, I, I see them both all the time. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, Tegan and Sarah growing up, uh, just absolutely loved them so much. And um, kind of like hip hop, you know, I kind of found indie uh, on my own. It wasn't, it wasn't punk rock, but it was kind of an offshoot uh, from punk rock. Uh, but it was a little, I would say, my brothers would call it soft uh because it was it was indie music uh but i loved it i really got into indie 
uh, which obviously Modest Mouse kind of was, you know, the quintessential indie band. And Tegan and Sarah was another one who had a real cult following. And they were from Calgary, Alberta. I was from Edmonton, Alberta. So they were only a three hour drive away. Um, saw them in concert several times from really small venues to bigger and just kind of saw their growth. And I, I always just loved how unique they were. They weren't like powerhouse singers in any way, uh, but they the way that they harmonized with each other and uh, just really interesting lyrical choices and how they had this really acoustic leaning sound. Uh, I just, I really loved and uh, all their records as kids. I, I, I listened to front to back hundreds of times. Uh, yeah, so yeah, they were definitely a favorite of mine. And that time, you know, of, of Modest Mass coming through and Tegan and Sarah coming through, that was a great time for indie music as well. Totally. Bright Eyes. Another yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. No one's ever chose a Bright Eyes track on this podcast so far. Why has that never happened? What a beautiful, beautiful band. Oh. Yeah, I, you know, I, I could have easily, uh, they're not, I, I guess they're not from uh, my home country. Yeah. Uh, he's from Omaha, Nebraska, I think. Um, uh, but if, hey, if they were from Canada, I probably would have picked them. Uh, <laughs> okay, right. Last track. And this is when you get to uh, to to be a tastemaker and turn someone onto something new. <laughs> it's a song that you think many people may not know, James, that you would like them to hear. Uh, I went kind of like selfish here, and I picked a song by us. <laughs> if you're uh, gonna get a shameless plug in, do it now, man. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, shameless plug. Uh, yeah, I really like this song. Uh, it's called "Shay" uh, by by Rare Americans, um, and it was a song I, I hoped would. Uh, do better uh to be honest with you people ask us that question sometimes what's what song of yours do you wish did better and i thought that this was a really great song um and it was really based on a true story i met this uh i was on a, a trip to the philippines a few years ago and um met this girl and instantly kind of had the you know that spark uh, that everybody wants everybody loves the spark and we totally had this spark and i was just like oh my god i, I was just so infatuated this girl but i saw on her finger she had this huge rock and i was like oh my god no this girl is <laughs> Are you, me? Like, you cannot be serious um but uh you know throughout the a few days later on this on this trip i ended up you know we ended up chatting a little bit more deeply and uh, i learned that her husband uh passed away and that she was a widow uh, and this was kind of a trip uh, for her. He he unfortunately had a had a brain tumor and, you know, had kind of like a long, slow kind of demise, which was, was super sad. And this was kind of a trip for her almost to heal. Um, and she really, uh, yeah, just opened up to me. And I think I was the first person outside of her, you know, friends and family who she was able just to let it all out to uh, and someone who wasn't so close to the situation. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, she really, uh, you know, really confided in me and we had this like really cool short, uh, you know, little mini love kind of thing for, you know, for, for a week or two. And, uh, I think it was really healing for her and eye opening for me. And, uh, so this is a song that I kind of wrote about her situation. Um, and yeah, so I, I felt it was a very, very real, raw, honest song and, you know, about someone who was going through, you know, one of the toughest things that you could go through in losing your partner. Um, so yeah, that was a song by Rare Americans called Shay that I really liked and I uh, think other people might dig it too. Well, James, we make it easy for them to listen to it because we we put together a Spotify playlist to accompany awesome. the podcast with all of the tracks that we've we've spoken about today. Um, and we'll throw some bright eyes on there as well. Um, really? Okay, so we're, we're getting to the end of, of, of 2022. Uh, I think this episode will probably drop the first week of 23. Um, so let's talk 2023. What's happening? Oh, man, what isn't happening? Um, it's definitely the, the biggest year uh, for Rare Americans by a country mile. Um, we've done uh, these two long form I want to say that they're like the first of their time. Uh, they're like long form album, concept album, like movies, essentially. Um, they're both around 45 minutes. Um, and it's literally this. Every single song uh, is accompanied by a, a, a music video, but they're not. They're one big story, start to finish, beginning, middle and end, like you would watch in a film or a TV series. And 
the the album is uh, essentially a film so yeah. uh and we have two of these <laughs> uh so yeah really excited one is called searching for strawberries uh the story of jongo bongo which is about our bandmates uh jongo who went through a real soul searching period of his life a few years ago um he worked for ibm he was literally like a data analyst but you know all he wanted in life was to be a musician and he had this good paying job but he was trying to climb the corporate ladder who just kept pushing him down and didn't give two shits about him. So he ended up walking uh, the Santiago de Camino in Spain, which is like a 900 kilometer pilgrimage uh, where people uh, walk all through Spain, kind of soul searching almost for answers in their life. And uh, he did that and ended up uh, that, that led him to Canada. And then once he was in Canada, one thing comes to another and he somehow found us. Uh, so this is essentially a story all about his journey and kind of finding himself. Uh, and then the next one is called uh, Skids, uh, and that's a story of a group of kind of five high school kids, um, you know, influenced by, you know, growing up in Edmonton. And uh, these kids are dealing with their their parents telling them what to do, the school telling them what to do, questioning society uh, and, you know, sex, love, drugs, rock and roll. Uh, it's kind of the story of these five kids. Um, so these are both going to be like rare Americans mini movies. Uh, and I'm really excited. I, I think that they're they're cutting edge, man. <laughs> I hope people uh, I hope people really uh, sit down and get their popcorn out and consume it as a whole piece. Wonderful. And if people want to keep up to speed with uh, everything that's happening and, and release dates and stuff, where's the best place to keep up with you? Uh, we're, we're all over. It doesn't really matter if you're Instagram at Rare Americans, TikTok at Rare Americans, Twitter, same thing. Or we're pretty active on um, Substack and also uh, the email uh, email kind of newsletter. So we're at Rare Americans pretty well across all platforms. Wonderful. Well, if it's cool with you when this comes out, we'll tag you in it. So people, if they haven't found you already, can go and find you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Stu. I appreciate it. It's really nice uh, talking to you. James, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful Christmas and all the Thank best you. for 2023. Thank you. Well. Happy holidays. Thank you Bye. very much, man. Bye-bye. Yeah.